Welcome to snowy Canada. This is great, actually. I've, I've lived in California for 20 years, uh, but I always love, my heart's always in Canada. I love coming back, and I do indeed love the snow. I grew up playing ice hockey and skiing and skating and all those winter activities that you'd have to do here. So, number one, thank you for being a coach. Uh, it's really just, I love being around coaches. I am a coach as well. I coach uh, kids. Right now I'm coaching 10 and 11 year olds uh, in ice hockey and I've coached baseball and soccer and track and field and, and I've been around every sport. So it's just really uh, a great honor to be around people who serve and I know how hard it is to do what you do. Uh, coaching is messy and complicated. So what we're going to do today, um, I've condensed some of the things I've learned in the last 25 years into 30 minutes. So <laughs> we'll do our best to, it might be a little quick, but that's okay because I want to stimulate some reflection and some, some thinking on your part. And you'll have access to these slides. So if you see a book reference or something you want, don't worry if I move on to the next slide, you'll have, have a copy. So I'd really like you to just kind of absorb what I'm sharing, um, write down some questions. Maybe we can chat later about that. But so let's get this going. Um, what I'm going to share with you, uh, this is kind of a snapshot of any particular day for me. And it wasn't by design. Um, I had The job I'm doing now didn't exist uh, a few years ago. It just kind of uh, evolved. And I've always been very pat curious. I've always been very passionate about trying to understand why. Why does that work? And why does that work with that coach and that athlete? And so I, I've spent uh, many years as a scientist, but I don't do science for the sake of doing science and writing articles. I, I want to do practical science. I want to do things that make a difference. And so I always have one foot with a coach and one foot with a research lab. And so on any given day, I'll teach a class. I'll work with a graduate student. I'll meet with a coach. I'll go and coach. And then I'll have a phone call with a coach somewhere else in the world. So it's always uh, trying to solve that puzzle. But it should be evidence-based and informed. So I, I want to look at evidence that can help us make good decisions. But even then, as you know, you could have all the evidence and all the information, and you're still, I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> you have to be willing to experiment. And in fact, I was just on uh, the phone last night with uh, a volleyball coach, one of the best volleyball coaches in the United States, and they're going into the end of their season, and we're talking about how, how do we want to frame the last three games of their season. They're having a record season, and I, we, we bounced ideas back and forth, and, and we came to an idea, and I said, let's do it. You have to have the courage to try it. I don't know if it will work, but let's try. And I got up this morning, and I checked my account, and they lost. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. We're going to try, but you might have lost last night, but I guarantee you they're going to win long term because you it's about culture and the type of environment that we want to create. So I was in New Zealand doing a tour a few years ago, different coaches, and after one of the workshops, a coach came up to me and said, you know what you are? And I said, I, I don't know. What are you going to tell me? And he said, you're a pracademic. I had never heard that term before, but it kind of stuck, and it's, it's an actual word, and it's this idea of doing practical research. So uh, I had this book come out a few years ago. They asked me to write this book, and it took three years to write, and it's still not done. It's always a work in progress, and really all it did was teach me how much I don't know as you start to write and learn about things. And also the U.S. Olympic Committee asked me to write a framework, a kind of an overarching framework for good coaching that came out last year. And then I'm also the editor of the International Sport Coaching Journal. So I'm always looking for evidence, but trying to make sense of it with real coaches in real situations. And it's taken me to some really interesting places. This is just in the last few months, uh, working in Australia with the world champion rugby team, Melbourne Storm, uh, working with the world's best golf coach, a guy named Cameron McCormick, who's Jordan Spieth's coach. I was just with him actually last week. And then, of all places, the WWE in Orlando, and you say, what does that have to do with what we do in coaching? But performance is performance. Everything we do is a performance. And I always tell coaches, you have to think like a performer. When you're coaching, you're performing. So anytime I can spend time around a performance environment, I can learn, and we can learn how to be better. So what I decided to do for today is organize the session into these four common coaching moments. And when I was asked to write this book, I didn't want to have a traditional kind of 
format for a book where we'll have physiology and anatomy and teaching. And, and I thought, what? Coaches don't think like that. Coaches have to navigate moments. Everything you do is about navigating moments. What am I going to do in this moment with this athlete before this match, in the middle of this match, in this training session? Great coaches are very good at navigating the moments. And so I decided to organize what I've learned into moments, the four kind of common recurring moments that all coaches pretty much around the world, all sports, uh, have to navigate. You get, a, you get a team or you get an athlete, so there's kind of an envisioning moment where we have to start, so the big preseason in a sense. Then there's a moment where we're, we're in our season, we're traveling, we're competing, we're training. Then that season ends. There's, there's an ending. And that, that, that's another special moment that requires a different kind of approach. And then we'll have a bit of a pause. And I know every sport's different. It could be a week, could be two weeks, could be three months. But there's a pause before we jump back into the next season. And that also is a special moment. So I've organized the information I've learned into these four moments. I call them the four E's, envision, enact, examine, enhance, and then repeat, and repeat, and repeat. So it's incremental. And one of my favorite quotes is, think evolution, not revolution. It's constant, small steps. So I've picked out a couple of the key lessons that I thought would be important to share today from each of those three moments. And when we think about starting, where we start when we have an athlete come to us or we're putting a team together at the beginning of a season or a preseason, it's important to think about our purpose, our values, and our standards. And let's see, okay, this is a picture. This is me climbing a rock near where I live. No, <laughs> it's not me. I wish it was. It's not me. But this is close to where I live in California. This is Yosemite National Park. And this is an actual uh, world-renowned climber. And this is a quote from this climber when someone asked, why do you do that? Why do you do these crazy things? And this climber said, I certainly don't climb rocks to get on top of rocks. It, it's just like we don't coach to win a trophy, to win a medal, to win a banner. That cannot be the sole purpose of what we want to do. To me, that should be a given. Everyone competes because they want to win. So I'm not even going to talk about that. Let's look at why you do what you do. And this is the importance when you bring a team together and when you work with your athletes, thinking about why. Why are we going to go on this journey? and all this effort and time and energy that we invest into this really hard thing. And what I've seen with the best coaches, this is Jill Ellis, a World Cup winning coach, our Team USA soccer coach. And I'll actually be in Chicago in a couple of weeks doing an event with coaches like her. She was in one of these classes, and we were talking about this, and she said, it's always about people. Best in the world in her sport but it always starts with people. Your pe good coaches are people builders, and they think like people builders. You're in the people business, and this is a quote from her, coach people first, sports second. So you really aren't badminton coaches, you're people coaches who happen to play badminton. Toyota, I'll give you an example, world's number one company for a while. They don't view themselves as a car company. They're a people company. They build people who at the moment happen to be building cars. Who knows what they'll be building in 10 years or 20 years? People, 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 always about people. And this is uh, one of my favorite books. Uh, you may have seen it. It's called Start With Why. And it's written by a guy named Simon Sinek. And he uh, has lots of material online, very dynamic speaker. And he actually has a little um, uh, video about him talking about this idea of your purpose, your why. And he refers to this little model as the golden circle. People rally around your why, not your what. It's, it's hard to inspire people with a trophy. It's easier to inspire them with the joy of this experience and the love. You saw it in the video earlier today. Those kids weren't playing and having smiles on their face because they were thinking about an Olympic medal. They, they were connecting with why we play badminton and why we want it. This is such a great sport. And one, uh, so... That, that idea of a golden circle was not sports specific, but I always cut across disciplines. I looked at different fields to understand how performance. And so I, I took that idea of a golden circle and why, and I started to look at great coaches and, and what would their why be. And this is one of our great coaches in the United States. He's a high school coach. 
in California and a football coach, American football, and his teams over 12 years, they didn't lose a game in 12 years. And that the previous record was about 76 games undefeated, the national record, so they demolished that record. And in fact, he did it the right way. So he won, but he won with a clear sense of purpose. And uh, Disney made a movie about him. They actually wrote a book and they made a movie called When the Game Stands Tall, which is a really nice book um, about coaching. And if we were to look at his purpose and his golden circle in a sense, he would tell you, I, I didn't get into coaching kids to break a national record and have a movie made about me. It's always been about, it's a calling. It's a, my, my why and the way I rally people around my, my purpose has been to serve, has been to serve people, to serve young people and build people. And you start with the why, how do we do that? Demanding practices and rituals and routines. And the what, if all that works out, is better people and more wins. You can have both. And you see that with the best. And the, uh, the best way, I think, to rally people around your why is to have a very clear sense of your values. And, and in a sense, one captain of a team once told me, it's just the values are how we act around here. This is, this is what our why looks like in action. And I'll give you an example, a recent example of how powerful that can be if you have a clear sense of purpose and connect that with standards and values so there's alignment across what you do. There was uh, one of the, the, the biggest scandals in the world of sport last year was in cricket, Australian cricket. They had a ball tampering incident in South Africa with their captain and their lead bowler. And I have worked with Cricket Australia for a few years and so this was disastrous and cricket is the game in Australia so it was major major catastrophe and the fallout from that of course fire the coach suspend the players uh, major national inquiries the president's on the line calling the, the federation and just uh, by chance the person they elevated to head coach a former uh, renowned cricket player a guy named Justin Langer you see in the picture here uh, he was elevated to head coach and we had dinner the night, it just happened to be in Australia, and we had dinner the night before his first press conference. And so he was feeling all this pressure to win, because if you walk into the National Cricket Center in, Australia, in, uh, in Brisbane, in Australia, they, you'll see on the wall, one, 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 one. Everything they do is about being number one in the world in every form of cricket, men and women. One, one, one. It's all about being number one. And that's what got them into this situation in the first place. And so he was, there was this tension. He said, yeah, how we act and in respect to the sport. And we had this conversation about, you can still use number one, but tie it back to values and purpose and why you play. And we had dinner, and I didn't know what was going to happen. He went off and did his press conference, and then I was somewhere else in Australia, and someone said, you got to see his press conference today, what he said. Here's what he said at his press conference. First press conference as head coach of the Cricket Australia team. Yeah, absolutely. I actually just addressed all the players and the coaches then. Uh, I spoke to the coaches last night and a few days ago, so the message will be the same. The main message is we are the Australian cricket team, so it's the coaches the players, we're all in it together. So um, just the way we go out of business on and off the field, the, the, the behaviours that are expected, uh, if, we get it right, if we get it clear from day one, it makes things a lot easier from experience. What is the behaviour expected, given that you're, you're now about to head into the first tour post-South Africa? Yeah, I think we've got, to, we've got to aim to be number one in professionalism in the, in the world. Um, we've got to be number one in honesty. It's really important value. I think they're going to be number one uh, in humility. Because I said to the boys before, it doesn't matter how much money you got or how many games or how many runs. If you're not a good bloke, that's what people remember. So humility is important. Honesty is important. Um, our, our mateship's really important. Sticking together is really important. That's all of us in the Australian cricket team. Um, so they'd be the main values at this stage. Do you think you're going to England to cook? So when I saw that, I said yes. Okay, stick with values and purpose. And you will win and you will lose. You could do everything right and still lose. But you can't lose 
if you stay aligned with your values and your purpose, but you have to understand what your purpose is to begin with. So he's been trying to reshape that culture around those values and that purpose. And they've, they've won some and they've lost some, and, but they'll be, long term they'll be fine. And it's, it's important to have those values that are aligned with our purpose, but we have to put them into standards, behaviors. So especially for our young athletes, we have to help them understand what integrity looks like. What does honesty look like? It's just a word. What does it look like in our training center, in our gym? And one of my favorite examples of that with uh, one of the top coaches in the world, a guy named Mike Krzyzewski, who was Team USA basketball coach. He's coach at Duke University. And when he took over Team USA, they also had a crisis moment, fired their coach. He became the head coach, the new coach. The very first thing he did was people like LeBron James and Kobe Bryant, he met with them as a team and he said, forget about basketball for a moment, let's get clear on why we play basketball. We'll work on basketball later. Why do we play basketball? And then let's identify some standards and values that connect with that. And they didn't lose a game while he was coach. I think two world or three world championships, two Olympic gold medals. And what they ended up doing, this was his very, very first team meeting with, with that team. They identified a list of values that would align with why we play and how we play, and then specific behaviors. So what does that look like? And in this book, this is one of my favorite books because it's a book of moments. It's how he navigated taking over this team, his first practice, his first meeting, his first world championship, his, it's all these little moments, what did he do? And everything is aligned back with values and purpose. And, and so this, there's a picture there, a small picture above the book, uh, someone that I know who worked with him, that's on his desk. He framed uh, all their values and their standards, got all the players to sign it, and that sits on his desk at Duke University. And there's more, this is just a snapshot, there's about 35 that he lists in the book. But I like that example because it's, it's not enough to tell a 15-year-old kid, we're gonna play with respect. What, what does that look like? We have to show them, when you do this, this is respect. And to some of my favorite examples in action of that is uh, you, you help create the right kind of purpose and environment that's aligned with your values by infecting people. And this, this just came to me a little while ago. I wrote a little commentary, and these commentaries are free online. And we often hear people, everyone wants to talk about team culture and club culture, and we use terms like buy-in. Ah, I, I don't understand why they don't buy into it. We've got to get them on board. And it really hit me being around the best clubs in the world that they don't sell their culture. I'm not trying to get you to buy into how we do things around here. We infect you. And it got me thinking, it's really, it's like a virus. You spread your team culture and your purpose and your values the same way a virus spreads. Think about the flu, when people catch the flu. You're not trying to sell them the flu. Geez, I don't understand why they aren't buying into the flu. If you want them to get sick or get the flu, you sneeze on them, right? So you infect them. And it's the same thing with great programs and great clubs. They create infectious, contagious environments. So when, what's it look like when you walk into my gym? What's on the door? How do we greet each other when we come into our gym? How do we end a training session? Those are all infection points to, in a sense, transmit our values and our purpose. And there was a neat, this one picture here is with the All Blacks. This is the head coach of the New Zealand All Blacks. Rugby team, number one team in the world, all sports, widely regarded. And one of their key values is humility. So the coach has to be the most contagious. And you see here, world's best team, the coach is the first person on the truck loading and unloading gear when they arrive at a hotel, when they get out of the airport. They don't have someone else unloading the gear. They unload the gear. If humility is really one of our values, and I'm going to be the first one in line doing it. And then this uh, study came out just uh, about a month ago with uh, teachers. And again, it's how you infect people with your, your values. Teachers who just shake kids' hands when they walk into a classroom at the beginning of a day, just, hey, how you doing, Billy? How you doing, Sarah? It costs nothing, but it's an infection point. They have 20% 
uh, higher engagement, less disruption than, than teachers who don't do that across a day. So it translates into better environments. And I know a lot of teams have started to do that where, you know, when your athletes come into a gym, they shouldn't just drop their bag, go talk to their best friend or start warming up. If being a good teammate is important for us, they should go around and greet every one of their teammates. How you doing? How you doing? Nice to see you. I'm glad you're here. That's small touches, infection. So this first section to finish, I would encourage you to think about in, when I build a team and I build an environment that's going to be conducive to building people and getting better results, can everyone in my club or my program really identify why we play badminton? Can everyone, uh, if I've spent a day with you or a week with you at your club, would I be able to identify your values before you tell me? I should, I should be able to see it. I should be able to see them. And then do we inspect and reward values-based behaviors? That's rituals, routines, symbols. That's important. How, how do we have things at the end of each week, for example, where we reinforce and recognize people for their values? And uh, one of the best coaches in the United States, a soccer coach, once told me, he said, people do what you inspect, not what you expect. And it always kind of stuck with me. If you want people to act a certain way, you have to inspect it and reward it. Okay, so we move into the next phase here, in season. So we've set up the right environment, now it's time to coach. Let's go out and train and, and compete. And what do we know about what great coaches do in that moment? Three big things that I want to highlight, Mo the type of motivational climate that we create, athlete learning and practice design. Because you're going to spend 80, 90% of your time as a coach in training. So let's get really good at teaching. And a few years ago, I was interviewed, and partway through the interview, the interviewer said, well, you're supposed to be a world expert in coaching. You know what the word coach means, right? And I said, someone who coaches. I've never really thought about it. And they said, no, like the root of the word. And I said, I, honestly, I don't know. And so they proceeded to tell me what it means. And, and in fact, uh, the, the word coach is originated uh, several hundred years ago in, in Old English with aristocrats traveling by horse and carriage, traveling across Europe with their um, children in the, co in the carriage while they brought a tutor, because they were gone for long periods of time, and they had a tutor teaching their children while they were traveling. And that tutor, over time, just became known as a coach, because they traveled in the coach teaching. So, by definition, we are teachers, and we should think and act like teachers. And one of my favorite examples of that is this guy here. Uh, he was voted the coach of the 20th century. His name's John Wooden. He was a basketball coach at UCLA in Los Angeles, and won a lot, but also won the right way. And he's left, he lived to 99, and he left a legacy with us of, he wrote a lot about what he did and, and how he taught. And I worked at UCLA and, and spent time with him and, and learned a lot from him. And this little picture that you have, we actually wrote a little article before he died on what, what might the building blocks of a great coach be. So he had his own pyramid of success, which was for the athlete, performer greatness. But we uh, decided, wouldn't it be neat if we had a, a complementary pyramid for what the building blocks of greatness as a coach might be? And so this wasn't a scientific study. It was just working with players who had played for him, working with Coach Wooden, some scientists. And we came up with this, and I won't go through all this right now, but the bottom row of that, so great coaching starts with people. The bottom row is connect with people. Start with people. But I want you to hear it in his own words. Listen to how he described, this is just a short clip. This is him in his living room. I think he's about 91 here, uh, talking about, this is a home video talking about how he approached his work. I often hear you say, when I was teaching at UCLA, mm -hmm. and I notice a lot of times people ask you, well, were you a teacher as well as a coach? Coach? So I was wondering if you would just tell, tell me, what, what does that mean when you say, I was teaching at UCLA, and you don't say, I was coaching at UCLA? Well, if you're just coaching, I think it's different from actual teaching. Uh, and I felt that I was always a teacher. I think I've followed the laws of learning 
in basketball or baseball or tennis or whatever I taught as far as sports was concerned through the years as much as I did uh, teaching a youngster how to parse a sentence or something in English classes that I taught. I think uh, when we get away from the fact we're just coaching is kind of like coaxing them to do something. Teaching is just showing them how to do it and then getting it to the point where they will do it automatically. Uh, so I, I, I always considered my teacher rather than rather than a coach, yes, and uh, tried to tried to by example teach by example too, and I, I think that's very important. I, way back in the mid '30s, I picked up something, and I, I still don't know who it was. You might know who wrote it. That, that, uh, no written word, no spoken plea can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books on all the shelves. It's what the teachers are themselves. That made an impression on me in the middle 30s. And I never forgot it. So in that little clip, you hear him say the word teacher about 20 times. He always thought of himself as a teacher, for, and he never even called himself a coach. The best coach of all time never referred to himself as a coach. He always referred to himself as a teacher. So if we want to be great teachers, if that's the essence of great coaching, we have to know how to teach. So what are the, when I was asked to write this book, I, I spent a lot of time trying to learn about learning. And what do we know about good teaching? What are the principles of teaching? There's four basic principles to, being, to teaching effectively. Number one, we need to know where to start teaching. So we have a tendency as coaches to design lesson plans and practice training plans, and, and we start teaching. But we need to first ask our athletes or do assessments to determine where do I start teaching? Where should I start this journey? Because that will impact how much they learn and the effectiveness of the learning. Motivation. Don't just assume they're going to learn what I want them to learn because I'm telling them or I'm the coach. What's their motivation to learn what I want them to learn? And we often overlook that as well. We just start teaching. I need to understand the pieces. If I want to teach them any skill, I need to understand the pieces of it. It's like a puzzle. When you get a puzzle and you're trying to put a puzzle together, you put all the pieces on the table and you put the box cover. Usually you'll leave the box cover up so you're looking, you always see the complete picture while you're working on the puzzle. So we need to show our athletes that complete picture and let them see it a lot while they're working on the pieces. And then the last one is, the right kind of practice with the right kind of feedback. And you may have heard of that term deliberate practice uh, and some of the research in that area. It's not the number of hours that you do, it's the type of practice that you do. So good coaches spend a lot of time with their athletes practicing things they're not good at. And that's hard. And it looks ugly. And it's messy. And then also the feedback components. So when I design a practice plan or a training plan, in addition to drills and how much time I'm going to spend, I should have a column for feedback cues. So what words do I want to use when I'm teaching this drill? So they hear the same words over and over and over again, and I'm more deliberate about it versus reacting. And to teach what? So if, I'm, if, if I do a good job of teaching, what am I trying to teach? The International Sport Coaching Framework, when we worked on that, um, and, and looked at the research on athlete outcomes. Good coaches build athletes in these ways. These are our targets. These are what we're trying to hit. We want better athletes, that's the competence. We refer to them as the four C's, competence, confidence, connection, and character. Better badminton player, more resilient badminton player, so that's the confidence part. Mentally tough, they're gonna come back after they lose. Because remember, if I want them to do deliberate practice, it's going to be ugly. The default is going to be failure. You have to want to come back and try it again. So resilience is important. Connection is better teammate. Better, and the character is respect for the game. Leave the game in a better place than when we, when, when we came to it. And this is a framework we use around the world now. And I'll give you an example of what that looks like in action. So this guy with his hands up, uh, he's, the head coach has his arms up. He was voted the best volleyball player of all time. His name's Karch Karai. And he's the head coach of uh, the Team USA volleyball team, women's volleyball team. And there's been 17 world championships in women's volleyball. The United States has never won at all, ever. They've been close, and they're always very good, but they've never won. He became head coach 
first world championship as a head coach, two years after taking over the team, they won their first world championship. Never been done, new coach, first world championship, they win. What changed? And just by chance, about 10 days after this picture, he's sitting right in front of me in a class. I was teaching a class for US uh, Olympic coaches. And so we talked about it after. I said, what changed? What was different? Same players. What changed? So this is what changed. This is a group of coaches. Uh, we have a learning cohort that we do, and Karch is in that picture. And he said, I read this book, this book called Mindset. It's not a coaching book. It's not a sport book. Uh, and I'd highly encourage you to read it if you haven't seen it. It's a great life book. If you have kids or you work with people, it's a great, great uh, resource. He said, I read this book, and it got me thinking about how we train. And he said, and then this is his philosophy, handwritten notes. And you see there, I circled, he said, job one, my job one as a coach is gro growth mindset. And that's a term from this book. And at the bottom of that box, you see mistakes, dot, 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 ugly. And so he said, it struck me after reading this book that uh, when you came to watch us practice, so if you come to Southern California and watch one of the world's best teams practice, you'd see what you'd expect to see. You'd see a really clean practice. You'd see great athletes looking like great athletes. But we're not getting better. So as a young athlete in all sports, they're often trained to kind of fear mistakes. Mistakes are bad. In fact, some coaches punish athletes when they make mistakes. So why would I ever want to risk and try and do something that's hard? I'm going to get punished for it. So he had to break that mindset. And he, he said, you know what? Instead of getting punished for making mistakes, you're going to get punished, if I go here, you're going to get punished if you don't make mistakes. So it's this idea that, I'll go back to this one, let's see if this one comes back. He said, in, in this book, when I was learning about feedback and teaching and environments, I want to keep my athletes in a growth mindset kind of environment. So they have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's really hard for kids, right, if you work with kids. That's not a natural inclination. They want to get it right. But you will not get better unless you practice things you're not good at. And so you're going to be failing a lot. So I want you in a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset kind of approach. So he's, there's a quote from him, you better be making mistakes in practice or you're not getting better. So he said, now, if you come to watch the world championship volleyball team practice, you're going to walk out of the gym going, wow, that's the best team in the world? They look awful. Yeah because we're practicing hard things that we're not good at yet, and we're, get, and, and we're getting better. It's not clean, it's ugly. And, and so really, the main difference between a fixed and a growth mindset is people who have a fixed mindset spend most of their time trying to prove their ability. So if you let a kid, you watch kids, if you just have open gym, kids who go in and practice stuff, their, their favorite shot, the things they're really good at, that's kind of a fixed mindset. They're trying to prove, look how good I am. Look what I can do. Watch the kids who are struggling with things they can't do well yet. Those are the kids who have a lot of potential because they're willing to fail and learn hard things. So those are the kids who are focusing on improving their ability. Very small but major difference. Focus on proving ability versus focus on improving ability. Left side, clean practice. Uh, your right side, ugly practice. And that's why that coach wrote his philosophy, mistakes, dot, 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 ugly. They're not ugly. <laughs> it's, it's how we get better. And this leads to how we design our practices. When we look at training environments across sports, practices are not well designed. We, we don't really spend a lot of time learning how to design a learning environment. And there's a lot of off-task behavior and boredom. And so what do we know about great practices? Great practices have four things. Every drill should have purpose. There's got to be some variety in my practice or my training session to, for motivation and to keep people engaged. Make it competitive as much as possible. If you didn't coach a training session and you just let kids play, the first thing they're going to do is make teams and play games and keep score. That's wired into us. We're competitive by nature, so make your practices competitive and keep them fast, game speed as much as possible. These are four common features of great practices. And the last little piece here on, on this middle section, 
in our training sessions, if I'm asking you to do ugly practice, deliberate practice a lot, that's really hard. And it's also hard on, on my self-esteem and my, my confidence because I'm failing a lot. So I need to balance, kind of counterbalance that with what we might call free play. So there should be time in my training sessions to let them play. And sometimes if you look at that from the outside, people may say, hey, you're not coaching right now. They're just playing. Yeah, that's fine. Social, connection, be a kid. And we'll train, but there needs to be some of that in there as well. Otherwise, I'm going to lose them. And you're not, you'll never hear a kid, I doubt, say, hey, when are we going to go work badminton? Can we work badminton today? They want to play badminton. So the training, the work part, is the deliberate practice. But we have to counterbalance that with play. So we know that great coaches in season design environments that are growth mindset kind of environments that focus on improving. So they're kind of ugly. Practices are going to look ugly. Uh, they take consideration of where to start teaching. Are my athletes ready and willing to learn? And then they think like engineers. So they, they think not just a list of drills, but how and why is this structured the way it is? And does it align with these things? The next two sessions are quicker. Uh, that was really the bulk of what we do. So we get to the end of a season, and we finish a season. What do good coaches do in this moment? We need to pause to recognize the things that are, are going well and also have some closure. Think everything we do in life has closure. There's some this beginnings and ends. And in fact, people remember, there's research on memory and psychology, the, the, the two things people remember most from an experience are the peak and the end. So the end of a season is a very powerful moment as a coach to help reinforce our values. So number one, at the end of a season, how do you know if you did a good job? You may have won, you may not have won, who knows? But how do you know if you did a good job? Good coaches take a moment to reflect on, did I achieve these four C's? Did we, my athletes get better, more resilient, better people, and joy and passion for the badminton? These are four things I should come back to. But we have a tendency in sport, when we do evaluations, to focus just on gaps. What are we missing? What do we need to get better at? What's holding us back? British cycling used the term marginal gains. You know, what are the little things we need that are still out there that we need to get better at? But I've learned great coaches, they, they pay attention to that, but they don't dwell on that. They spend equally or more time on what do, what's going right. What are we doing well? And let's do more of that because let's work to our strength. Why is, let, let's use our strength more than focusing so much on our gaps. And this is quite, uh, becoming quite popular in the business literature. And when we look at strengths, this is an activity I like to do as coaches. It's one of our U.S. Olympic coaches. You know, think back at the end of a season. Just take a moment and ask yourself this question. What was our best day or my best day of coaching this past season? And you could do this weekly or monthly. What was my best day? And then why? Why was that your best day of coaching? And that's going to reveal your strength as a coach. That's when you're at your best. Let's look like that more often. What do we have to do in our environment to have more days that look like that? See how it's different than, hey, what's going wrong? Where are all our gaps? And to have closure at the end of the season is very important too. It's a long journey. It's a lot of effort. So what do some coaches do to kind of bring closure to that experience? This is an American football coach, a high school coach, played professional football. And he talks about the last practice. So you think the last training session, what might that look like? It should be different than the other training sessions. That's, that's an ending. And this is what his last practice looks like with his athletes, 15 to 18 year old athletes playing football. They do their practice, they go into their locker room, they change, and they come out of the locker room holding hands, partners, the senior players at the front of the line. And they walk around the club, the school, the environment, and they pause. So they, they do a final kind of walk, walk around, and they pause at important spaces, 
a tree that was planted in memory of a, an alumni or a fallen teammate, uh, maybe some banners, maybe where they used to eat lunch. And they just kind of reflect on what these spaces meant to us in this experience, in this journey. They finish at the practice field, but only the seniors who are leaving the team get to go on first, and they get to make peace with the field, the place where they, they trained and they bled and they sweat. And then the junior players come on, they have one final huddle. So it's not the practice, it's the principle. Having some kind of closure to these experiences, these journeys, is very, very important. And then also to recognize when we have many sports, we have banquets and, and ways to recognize our athletes and reinforce our, our core values. And some of the things that I've seen, you can be as creative as you want to be, but instead of just giving out awards for most valuable player or most improved player, um, top scorer, there's unlimited possibilities. And these are just a few that I've seen that are, are kind of fun. Giving out an award, a nails award for the player who is tough as nails, giving out a glue award for the player who was our, our stickiness, tied us together as a team, kept us together as a group. Uh, the hard hat, an actual construction hat that they give out to the toughest player who came to work every day. And it's, again, it's not the practice, it's the principle. So all of these things, what they have in common is the awards at the end of the season are connected back to our why and our core values. There has to be some connection back, some alignment. And one of my favorite examples of this one is called the Goofus Award. And it may not translate well, but jokester, someone who's silly. And this is one of the top ice hockey teams in uh, the United States, Michigan State University. And I was doing an event there, and I was walking around the arena. They've won three national championships. And I was looking at all the trophies and all the awards, and I saw this behind the glass. It said, Goofus Award. And I had to look, and I said, what is that? I've never seen that before. And I took a picture, and I talked to some people who played for them. And they said, yeah, that's an award we give out at the end of the season, right beside most valuable player, top scorer, most improved. I said, why? And they said, because we're trying to do hard things, win national championships, but it's we never want to lose sight of the joy of why we play hockey. It should be fun, being around teammates, being in the locker room, joking around with each other. So we're going to give an award for the one player who best exemplifies that and brings that to our team. I thought, great, an award that's tied to your values. Perfect. So when you finish a season, I'd want you to think about things like, how do I know if I did a good job? And it has to be more than winning and losing. What kind of rituals do I have at the end of the season to kind of close this experience before we start the next journey? And then what types of recognitions do I use to reinforce our core values and our purpose, our why? So the last one here, we'll finish on just a couple minutes. Off season. We made it, we got through the season. And in fact, I've been around some sports where they said, well, wait, we don't really have an off season. <laughs> We're just going. I said, well, there's got to be a, a few days or a week or something. So, okay. So what do great coaches do in those moments, that off-season moment? Two things they focus on. Reload, so basically plug your battery back in, refresh, make sure you're he healthy and well, and then get better. Really invest in getting better. You should be getting better every time you coach, but the off-season is a great opportunity to really get better. And when I show this, I put this picture up at a, an Olympic event a while ago. Because to me, and I actually had a coach in the room, a very senior coach, start to cry. And he knew as soon as he saw that picture, said, yep, that's my life. Coaching is lonely. You're around people all the time, but you're alone. You're expected to have the answers and serve and protect everybody else and know what everything, where everyone should be. Who's, who's supporting you? Who's coaching the coach? So we haven't done a good job across sports, I've seen, in providing infrastructure and support for our coaches. It's really hard. And uh, Jose Mourinho, who might be coaching somewhere else if you follow soccer <laughs> soon, uh, but this is a quote from a great coach. You know, tr pushing athletes to do things they don't think they can do is really hard. So go back to ugly practice and deliberate practice. That's hard and emotional and draining. Your tank is being emptied every day. Who's filling your tank? 
And I like this analogy, so I started to look into this a little bit more. What can we do to help coaches? And when you fly and they give the safety demonstrations, you know, they always say, in the case of an emergency, secure your own mask first before you start helping other people. But what do we do as coaches? The first thing we do when we wake up in the morning is start putting on other people's masks. We check our texts, our emails, get online, phone. We're making sure everybody else has their mask on. Well, what about your mask? So it's kind of, you need to be selfish. And it's kind of often viewed as a, a negative characteristic. Oh, don't be so selfish. If you're not healthy, you can't serve other people. So you need to be selfish. And when I look, there's this neat article in Harvard Business Review about really successful people and some of their habits. And they all start their day, they use this term, they start their day on offense. So they put their mask on first when they wake up. And that could be 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever you can. Go for a walk, work out, read a book, anything that helps you kind of put your mask on before you start putting other people's masks on. And, and I've really started to do this more and more, and it makes a huge difference. Because people, your athletes will read your energy when you walk into a room. So you want to make sure you have good energy when you come in. And so speaking about energy, uh, these are some books that coaches and athletes have shared with me that I've really enjoyed uh, that reinforce that idea of the kind of energy that we bring to an environment and how important that is for us as a coach. And um, all these books are, are, are fun reads. The Energy Bus, the yellow one, if you haven't seen that, there's a great website. And kid, you could give that book to kids. Uh, a lot of schools use that book with their kids. Um, but I'm just going to show you this little video because when I have longer workshops, we actually do um, we kind of create our learning and support network, we map it out, and then we actually grade the people who are in our network. Are they good energy givers or are they energy suckers? <laughs> so let's make sure we have lots of energy givers around us. So, but there's one criteria that uh, doesn't get talked about a lot, and it's empathy. So I just want you to see this little video. This, is, this little video that you're going to see is um, the author of that book, Daring Greatly, and it's animated. It's her voice talking about the importance of empathy, okay, and this is really important as a coach. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. 
Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So that, that's a really important point. And it's funny, that book, Daring Greatly, written by that author, Brene Brown, she, if you look her up, she has many books and, and she's uh, quite influential right now. But that, within a week, I had a captain of one of our, our college teams bring me that book and her coach <laughs> a week later. So the athlete found a lot of uh, joy in reading that book and b the coach did as well. They didn't know that, that was independent. But that book really gets to the point of you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to have the answers, let go of that and be more empathetic with people, with your athletes and surround yourself with other people who are empathetic towards you and it will help fill your tank, so to speak. So the last little uh, example I share with you, the, the best teams in the world get it more and more. They're, so they're going to hire a head coach, but they're going to hire a coach for the coach. So it's not enough to have someone you can talk to in the off season. You should have, we want somebody filling your tank and putting your mask on all the time. Uh, and one of my favorite examples of that is the Golden State Warriors basketball team. And this picture in the middle, if you ever watch, see them on TV, you will always see this picture. The head coach with the blue tie is named Steve Kerr. And this is his first job as a head coach. And although he's won championships as a player. And so the Warriors, the team, knew that he's going to be emptying his tank a lot, and he's never done that before, so it's going to be very easy for him to feel isolated, lonely, uh, burned out. Can we hire someone to sit right beside him and fill his tank all the time? Sure we can. And so there's a guy in the NBA who's renowned for that, as being a tank filler in a sense, and that's the guy sitting beside him with the glasses. His name's Ron Adams. And he actually coached at the university I, I work at and years and years ago, he, he could be a head coach in the NBA. He's a brilliant coach. But he's really made his career as a coach's coach. And so you see these three pictures. When the Boston Celtics hired a very young first-time coach named Brad Stevens, they hired Ron Adams to sit beside him on the bench. Chicago Bulls hired a guy, Mike Thibodeau, as a, as a young career coach. They hired Ron Adams to sit beside him on the bench. The Warriors, when they hired Steve Kerr, hired Ron Adams away from the Boston Celtics. Said, we need that guy sitting on the bench next to our coach. And you see the results. They've been a phenomenal team. And the New York Times actually did a little article about this a little while ago, if you want to read more about it. Uh, the New York Times did this article. And this is a quote from Steve Kerr the head coach, saying, I wanted somebody whose experience and wisdom would, would have some weight. So he has a lot of weight in the room. He's a very good basketball coach. But it, it's just having someone who's constantly around to kind of check on me and fill my tank it, it has been instrumental. And then the last piece here, let's keep getting better. So we finish the season. We want to go deep on recharging, but we also want to make sure that we're getting better, deeply better. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Coach John Wooden. It's what you learn after you know it all that matters most. And, and so you're never done. You're never complete. You're always learning. And what do great coaches do to make sure they're always learning? Uh, Coach Wooden, at the end of every season, he did a study. So he would identify all the things he wanted to get better at, and he'd pick one. And we have a tendency to go shallow. We try and learn a little bit about a lot of things. He said, I'm going to pick one in the next month. I'm going to go, or two months, I'm going to go very deep on one thing. So if you're getting really good at one thing every off season, you know, over a 30, 40 year career like his, you're going to be very, very good. Bill Belichick, New England Patriots football team, one of the best teams in the world right now, he assigns each of his coaches on his staff to learn one thing at the end of every season. So they come back. That's, they're always getting better. They're always in the Super Bowl. because They're always learning. An example of how we can keep learning, not just topics, but coaches, Let's focus on who do I want to learn from. So not just what do I want to learn, who do I want to learn from. And one of my favorite examples of that is this guy, Cameron McCormick, who was, is Jordan Spieth's coach, also coach number one women's golfer from South Korea. And 
uh, when he was a young coach, he realized I need to learn how to, I need to keep getting better too. And so he got a list of the top 75 golf coaches. They publish a list every year in Golf Digest. And he wrote a, the same letter to every coach. And it just said, I'm Cameron McCormick. I'm a young golf coach. Would you mind if I came and watched you coach? About 20 of them wrote back and said, yeah, come on down. But the number one person on his list said, yeah, come on down. The number one person on the list was a guy named Butch Harmon, who was Tiger Woods' coach when he was number one in the world. So that was not mandated. That was something he took initiative on his own to get better. And now we continue to do these kind of study tours with these coaches. And then the last thing that kind of hit me on getting better, great coaches love to read, but they don't have time to read. Great coaches are notorious, or coaches are notorious book starters, right? I've started a lot of books, but how many have you finished and really digested? And it's hard to do on your own. So we have book clubs for everything else. Why don't we have book clubs for coaches? And uh, we started some of these virtual book clubs around the world. And it's funny because my daughter is 14 and she had on her phone, this is where it really hit me a few years ago, she had her phone open on the table and it was open to the Harry Potter book club. I said, well, why don't we have book clubs for coaches? Same thing, right? And these two books that I highlighted are two books that we've read in some of these book clubs in the last uh, year that have been really impactful. Coaches really like these books. But there's lots of examples. So the key is I need to build a strong learning network to help me stay in learning mode, just like I do for my athletes. So we've made it to the end of the session. I've almost used my full 45, but I knew it was going to be close. Um, but we can think about what are those key things that we do in each of those moments. And I really appreciate your time uh, this morning. I look forward to learning from you.